The town of Sharpsburg, Maryland sits in an atmosphere of tenseness, the smallest spark ready to set off a powder keg. Sentries under the command of John Bell Hood and Daniel H. Hill stand in silence as they look over the rolling hills of Maryland. This is the first time many of them have ever laid their feet upon northern soil. They stand ever watchful for their hated federal foe that maneuvers somewhere beyond the distant ridges and creeks. The Yankees have attacked once three days ago and there's a chance for an even larger engagement here on this crisp Wednesday morning on September 17, 1862. When the dawn breaks over the quiet fields and forests, this tiny town in western Maryland will bear witness to the single bloodiest day in American history. This battle will pit the military genius of Robert E. Lee and his Confederate Army of Northern Virginia against George McClellan and the raw manpower of the Union Army of the Potomac. More than 130,000 men will take up arms in this battle, and in the span of 12 hours, more than 23,000 of them will be dead, wounded, or missing. This is the Battle of Antietam. How did this tragic day come to pass? How is it that these two generals have led their armies here at this place and time? This bloody affair found its beginning only a few short months ago at the start of 1862. General McClellan and his Army of the Potomac had invaded Virginia and had almost reached his goal of taking Richmond. They were in pursuit of then Joseph E. Johnson's 60,000 strong army in Northern Virginia, who was retreating towards his defensive lines around the Confederate capital. While Johnson's army prepared for a siege, McClellan was inching his army ever so closer to Richmond. It was said that the Union soldiers could hear the church bells ringing in the city only seven miles away. Johnson knew that his army could not survive a drawn out siege, so he decided to attack the two isolated Union Corps, the 3rd and 4th Corps, south of the Chickahominy River in what would come to be known as the Battle of Seven Pines. Johnson would attack on May 31st, resulting in a meat grounder conflict, succeeding in only inflicting massive casualties to both armies. It would be on the first day of this battle where fate intervened to allow the Battle of Antietam to come to pass. General Johnson was viewing his lines around dusk when he was hit by shrapnel from a cannon blast and knocked unconscious, injured grievously. The command of the army would fall to his second in command, Gustavus W. Smith. On the second day of fighting, the Confederates would make strong counterattacks, but made little headway until they were forced to retreat when more fresh Union reinforcements arrived. Despite both sides claiming victory, McClellan's advance ended. Gustavus W. Smith, who failed to follow up on the second day of the battle, was replaced by Jefferson Davis's military advisor, Robert E. Lee. Due to the Battle of Seven Pines, McClellan was cautious to engage the Confederates, giving Lee another month to reorganize his army and plan ahead. Just like Johnston, Lee knew his army could not survive a siege, so he decided to become the attacker instead of the defender. McClellan would try one more time to advance on Richmond, which ignited the Seven Days Battle. McClellan advanced on Richmond by attacking along the Williamsburg Road. In his path stood Confederate General Benjamin Hooger. Hooger's Confederates would not only hold firm against the multiple Union divisions, but would send the Union forces scrambling in a panic retreat on June 25th, in what came to be known as the Battle of Oak Grove. McClellan's forces gained only 600 yards of ground before being driven off. Now the Union was on the back foot against a tactically minded Lee. With this success, Lee kept up his momentum and engaged the Federals at Mechanicsville on June 26. The battle was held in a stalemate until the timely arrival of Thomas J. Jackson. General Jackson, who was busy tying up the Federals in the Shenandoah Valley, had finally arrived to support Lee in the attack. Near the end of the battle, annoyed with the delay of the events and against Lee's orders, Ambrose P. Hill and Daniel H. Hill attacked Fit John's orders in trench Federals, but were beaten back with heavy casualties. Despite the relative success Union forces enjoyed with defending their positions, McClellan was inordinately concerned with the buildup of Confederates on his flanks, thus threatening his line of supply. There was also his concern about the Confederates south of the Chickahominy, the Confederate divisions of General John B. Magruder and the recently successful General Benjamin Hoover managed to occupy four Union Corps from maneuvering in response to the heavier fighting to the north of the river with divisionary attacks of their own. All this was compounded that McClellan feared and had reported to his Washington superiors to be facing over 200,000 Confederate soldiers, despite the actual number being more than half of that. This goes to explain why McClellan ultimately ordered a withdrawal of his forces to the southeast, with General Porter concentrating around Gaines Mill. 
in what was the largest Confederate assault of the war with about 57,000 soldiers in six divisions, Lee ordered his forces to attack on June 27th, engaging around 34,000 Union troops at Gaines Mill. The initial advances were uncoordinated, and the forces of Generals D.H. Hill and James Longstreet suffered heavy casualties in their first two attempts to break the Federals. General Fitz John Porter, backed up eventually by General Henry Slocum, did well in repelling such a dedicated assault. A third time the Confederates advanced thanks to the likes of General John Bell Hood's Texas Brigade and General George Pickett's division, the Union line finally broke. The Federals retreated in the morning hours of June 28th, streaming toward the south. Despite the gallant stand of General Porter's forces and the relatively good position the Union Army was in, General McClellan seemed to hold a fear of Lee's dogged pursuit. McClellan ordered Porter to Malvern Hill to prepare defensive positions while he himself moved to the south of Malvern Hill to protect his command. This left the Army of the Potomac's Corps commanders without standing orders for the retreat, causing the Army to consolidate around Savage's Station, a nearby railroad hub. Lee continued his attack on the 29th and fought this rearguard at Savage's Station. However, a continuous breakdown of communications with both Federal and Confederate commands ensured that the battle was nothing more than a bloody stalemate. From the less than aggressive advance by General Thomas Jackson, who was supposed to defeat the Federals at Savage's Station, to the erratic command of the Union's 2nd Corps commander, Edwin Sumner, of throwing regiments from separated divisions into battle almost at random. The crushing defeat of the Federals that Lee had anticipated had been lost. Despite this, the Federals continued to retreat towards the James River in supposed safety. The Confederates continued their pursuit, once again catching up to a majority of the Union Army at Glendale. Again, the Confederates pushed forward, yet ultimately failed to encircle or destroy the Federals, again with nothing but another few thousand casualties to show for it. The Union forces again managed to escape from the area, fleeing toward Malvern Hill and Harrison's Landing, finding both strong defensive positions and ships to evacuate the Army. Lee decided to hit McClellan's army one more time and attack the entrenched Federals at the Battle of Malvern Hill, as was evident with the rest of the Seven Days Battle. Lee's complex plan to annihilate his enemy was undercut by poor execution by his generals and having to deal with his enemy in a superior position. Lee ordered his army to march on Malvern Hill under heavy fire. His army suffered at the hands of the Union artillery, sharpshooters, and gunboats. Confederate General D.H. Hill, whose division was involved in some of the heaviest fighting of that July 1st day, framed this final conflict of the past seven days perhaps as clearly as one could. It wasn't war, it was murder. Dissatisfied with the failure of McClellan, Lincoln raised the Army of Virginia and put John Pope at its head. Pope was an aggressive leader unlike McClellan and invaded Virginia from Washington, D.C. on July 29th, aiming to defeat the Confederates soundly as General McClellan couldn't accomplish a few weeks previously. This mobilization concerned General Robert E. Lee. If Pope's army managed to merge with McClellan's army, there was a real possibility of Lee's forces being overwhelmed in a tide of federal divisions. Lee decided to send the generals Thomas Jackson and A.P. Hill ahead of the main army to distract Pope, hoping to give time for Lee to consolidate his newly reformed Army of Northern Virginia to respond to this growing threat. The Confederates were attacked at Cedar Mountain on August 9th and were hard pressed by Pope's vanguard, almost being driven off the field. However, the Confederates were able to rally thanks to the efforts and bravery of General Jackson rallying his old brigade command of Virginians to turn and throw themselves back into the Federal advance. This frenzy melee allowed time for the retreating Confederates and A.P. Hill's reinforcements to reform their line of battle and launch their own mighty assault against the Federals. The Yankees, tired and disorganized from their early pursuit, were quickly turned and began their own retreat. Once again, the morale of the Confederates managed to hold out against the manpower of the Federals. This victory caused the forces of General Pope to be put on the back foot against Lee and his army, despite another sizable gap in manpower between the Federals and Confederates. After some skirmishing along the Rappahannock was concluded in a draw, General Jackson marched his forces through the thoroughfare gap and raided Manassas Junction. 
Pope, hoping to play the aggressor and believing General Jackson to be in a desperate position, marched his own army toward Jackson, who ironically settled on the grounds of the Battle of First Manassas. For two days, August 28th to August 29th, General Pope launched attack after attack against General Jackson on the slopes of Stony Ridge and what would come to be known as the Battle of Second Manassas or Bull Run. Despite the gallant advance of Pope's forces, Jackson's Confederates managed a strong stand of their own. Driving back each renewed federal attack, massive casualties were inflicted upon each side in the days of fighting. On August 30th, Pope once again formed his forces to slam into Jackson's line, believing the Confederates to be at the breaking point. However, a different tale of the battle was soon being unfolded. On the south end of the battlefield, a new massing of Confederate artillery blew apart much of the Union V Corps under General Fitz John Porter as they moved into their assault against Jackson. Immediately afterward, a nearly mile and a half long line of 25,000 Confederate infantry showed itself moving through the heavily wooded area of the southern end of the battlefield. They pushed northward to roll up Pope's line, and the results were devastating for the Federals. Pope at first could not believe it. He had thought that Jackson had been quickly defeated before there was any chance of the Confederate reinforcements he knew would be commanded by General Longstreet. What had happened? It was while Jackson and Pope fought back and forth that General Longstreet would break through the Federal lines at the Battle of Thoroughfare Gap, allowing both wings of the Army of Northern Virginia to unite. This occurred on August 20th. The first day that Pope began his assault against Jackson, the minimal defense of the gap by the Union forces had barely hampered Longstreet's advance to join up with Jackson. And now both wings of the Army of Northern Virginia arrayed themselves against Pope, one half of which now is positioned to roll his entire flank and drive the Federals into Bull Run Creek. Together, Jackson and Longstreet would envelop Pope, send him retreating toward Washington in the span of a day, a second painful reminder for the Union of the First Battle of Manassas. On August 31st, having been defeated only a day before, General Pope was torn between his corps commanders that advised a retreat and an order from the Union General-in-Chief Henry Halleck to attack as soon as he was able. That night, the sightings of Confederate cavalry and infantry on his army's right flank indicated his worst fears. The battered Federal Army was in danger of being rolled on its flank and utterly destroyed. Across the field in the Confederate camp, General Lee had also foreseen this outcome. However, Lee was also all too aware that the weeks of continuous marching in a near three-day battle, his fellow Confederates were in no condition to push the Federals again. Still, Lee ordered his right hand, Stonewall Jackson, to flank Pope's army on the right and entrap the Federals at their camps in Centerville. Jackson's corps, exhausted from their work at Bull Run, made the march, but only got so far before they were spotted. This grand clash of armies would finally come to an end in peals and rolls of thunder on September 1st, barely a day after the Second Battle of Bull Run. Near the town of Chantilly, massive amounts of rainfall covered the battlefield as the two wary armies clashed by wet powder and bayonet. Confusion ran rampant as soldiers and officers pushed and slipped between opposing lines in the blinding rain. Major General Philip Kearney, commanding the Union troops on the field being chief among the casualties, Nightfall of September 1st came to show that Lee's army had failed to contain Pope, but his victories and blocking of the Federal Army had opened the way into Maryland. In just 90 days, Lee's push against McClellan forced a concentrated invasion away from Richmond and off the peninsula. The bravery and quick thinking of Lee's corps commanders had forced Pope out of Northern Virginia, despite being outmanned and outgunned in the span of only a month of battles. With the failure of Pope, McClellan was then reinstated as the commander of the Union Army of the Potomac. With no more threats to Virginia, Lee believed he had the momentum to possibly deliver the knockout blow to the North and win the war. So Lee decided that he would bring the devastating war to the homes and doorsteps of the Union citizenry. On September 4th, Lee crossed his army over the Potomac and entered Maryland, ending up forming into his Maryland campaign, which ultimately culminated in the Battle of Antietam. The results of the bloody affair were still nowhere close to the minds of Lee or McClellan, as they now began to draw up their maneuvers to respond to the other. The houses of the United States continued to stand divided, and there would be no quick end to this civil war. 